that they would st- one one of them would start talking about something that happened, and I'd say, "Oh yeah," and I'd finish the story, mm-hmm. or the other way round, um, I'd start talking about something, and then they'd finish the story. So mm-hmm. it was quite, <laughs> um, which was you know, it's nice confirmation. these people who can remember previous lives. We've written three books. In your first book, Yesterday's Children, you describe how you researched the memories of your previous lives. You, you visited Ireland and you actually in the end managed to meet the children who were the children in your previous life. Tell us, how did these memories emerge? How did this develop? Um, there are quite a lot of recorded cases of children who remember past lives. And I was one of these children who remembered past lives, quite a few of them. And you tend to remember fragments of detail in exactly the same way. If you look over your own present life, you tend to remember fragments. So um, it would be incidents, things that happened, places, uh, family members, uh, things that you did with family members. Uh, particularly, I remembered uh, Malahide in Ireland, and I remember being a mother of eight children. And I indicated the what the village looked like. I drew maps when I was very small. And the first time I managed to get hold of an atlas, I um, I thought, well, I've got to know where it is, because you know, obviously I would have known where I lived. So um, I looked at the atlas, and the only place that seemed to resonate with me was Malahide. And it did repeatedly. I was quite sure it was Malahide. So I was drawing uh, maps of the village of Malahide in Ireland, and there were eight children, and a number of, quite a number of um, little incidences, um, things, family things, like um, I remember um, stuffing the mattress. We had, the mattress had to be restuffed each year because we used chaff, uh, which was sort of left over from the harvest. So it, it, it became very compressed and hard at the end of the year. You had to redo it. And I remember one year putting too much in and we couldn't get it back through the door. And we all ended up in, a, in fits of laughter because we had <laughs> overdone the, the chaff in the mattress. So it's that kind of thing, just sort of small incidents. Mm. I also remembered um, Japan, a life in Japan. And there were other odd memories. Sometimes I didn't, um, I wasn't, it wasn't easy to actually piece the memories together. So I'd have isolated things like, um, I had a great fear when I was a small child of being uh, hit by a truck. Mm-hmm. I'd be walking on the pavement and I'm really quite fearful of being hit by a truck. Um, I remembered injuries, which suggested that I had actually been uh, hit by a truck. Um, I wasn't able to do very much during childhood, but I did reinforce the memories by revisiting them. Uh, talking about them, thinking about them. When did you first remember having memories from a past life? So I, I always knew that there were memories from a past life, but I didn't really talk about them until I uh, went to Sunday school. And um, I was rising four, so in, in three, uh, really. And um, we were talking in Sunday school about life and death and things and what happened after your life. And I was very confused. I didn't know why they weren't talking about what happened before this life. And I broached my mother about it. I remember sitting on the stool in the kitchen, talking to her while she was washing up. Um, and she seemed a bit surprised and then said, oh, it's, um, it's a belief. It's um, called reincarnation. And I thought, why is it a belief? Mm. Uh, and I went through quite a few years where I didn't understand why why other people didn't talk about it. Um, and then when I realised that they, they weren't going to, um, I thought people were in denial. I honestly thought that everybody, surely, could remember their other lives, at least one or two of them. Um, and it, I think it took me a long time to realise that actually people were being honest with me, they weren't remembering. Um, then I wasn't really able to do what I wanted to do as a child, which was visit the places um, particularly to visit Ireland and um, find out what had happened to the children there. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until I was an adult and then I started having children in this life. And it, I, I realised I'd suppressed a lot of it just to cope with living that here and now. 
Uh, but it got to the point where I really couldn't. It was starting to bother me a great deal. I knew I'd have to do something. Uh, coincidentally, at that time, I came across somebody who did regression hypnosis. And I tried that, and it, it kind of helped, but it also made it much harder because the memories I had then came sharply into focus. And I realized how much I'd been suppressing them and how I just couldn't anymore. So I had to start the research. And I, I did it, started off with a, a weekend trip to Malahide and visited the place. And it was really quite strange because when you move away from somewhere and then you go back, the things you notice are the changes. You know, what's been altered? I'll go around and go, oh, they've, they've moved the, um, there used to be a builder's yard there and there's a, there's a shop there now. And I go down to the jetty and I think, oh, concrete now, used to be wood. Um, and I was able to find my way around without any problem, but it was it was the differences. And in the, the lane itself, where I started to go down, because I'd always drawn exactly where the house was on, on which particular road. Um, it was the road out to Swords, and I knew it was on the uh, left-hand side. It was the first house. And um, I really couldn't find very much. Everything was so in ruins, and they'd built extra houses, which was confusing. But I knew at least... I was right, I had found the right place. So most of the research was when I came back and then started to write to people. Um, I managed to find a neighbour who remembered the family and was able to give me the surname, which I hadn't been able to remember. I'd got um, my name as Mary, mm -hmm. but I had, I'd had difficulty remembering the surname. At this stage, were you already aware that you were a mother and had several children? Yeah, well, I, I knew where it was. Mm -hmm. um, because, as I said, I, I'd, I'd found it um, as, a, as a child. I knew where, uh, the same with the Japanese memory, I knew where it was. I knew it was at the, the north extreme of the South Island. Um, so I always knew the location. But yes, it was continuous memory, although there were gaps. It was continuous memory. Mm -hmm. So I knew when. I had a rough time scale. Uh, it's annoying that a lot of past life memory is very subjective. So you remember how you feel. You remember smells and textures and emotions. You don't remember your telephone number or anything useful. I, anybody who says that they do, then they're, 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 they're probably not actually remembering a, a past life. You, it, because um, I suppose it's because of the transition, because you're, you're, you've got a memory that passes from one life to another. The things that you can, might consider important now, through that transition, transition stage, may not be important. Uh, so it does tend to be very much uh, a feeling, and uh, it's what you see, what you touch, um, textures of clothing, as I said, smells, that sort of thing, and, and events. So it's how you feel about an event. So the children in Ireland, I'd remember something like uh, Frank, as I found out, but the, the youngest boy. He used to fidget with the bottom of his clothing all the time. It was really slightly annoying, <laughs> but he used to just, with his fingers underneath the edge of the clothing. Um, but he was, I think he was a nervous, quite quiet, a quiet boy. So, personalities, yes, I remember. Um, I always have remembered. What was your motivation to start this research? It was partly I needed to find the children. I needed to find out what had happened to them. But also, uh, when you're growing up and people keep saying to you, oh, well, it's not real. And you know it is. Yes, I needed to find proof. Not to prove to anybody else, although that has been what it's turned into, but actually to have the evidence, to have the, look, I told you, this is, this is my memory, this is real. Um, not, not, you know, I, I went public with the story because it was cathartic to do so. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it may made me feel easier about the subject. But also, um, I realised other people would be in the same boat. And I thought it would be helpful if I shared my story. They might have it a little easier than I did as I grew up, because I had so much rejection mm -hmm. from people who just wouldn't accept it. You know, they just wouldn't believe what I was saying. And it was quite hard. One of the things it did teach me, though, is tolerance of views. So that if I wanted people to accept my point of view at all, or even listen to me, then I've got to be willing to accept that there may be other ways of looking at things. How did your parents react? 
to your memories? My mother was fairly good. I think, I think she found it quite hard, but um, I think she was probably reasonably open-minded about it. And as the evidence unfolded, of course, and uh, she'd grown up with me drawing all these maps and being quite obsessed with Malahide. So when it all started to unfold, it made perfect sense to her that it, 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 it should do so. I think my father found it harder but um, he did read the book eventually, and it was uh, since he's, he was severely dyslexic, it was the only book he'd ever read <laughs> in his life. So, it, yeah, that was, that was quite a nice, that he actually read it. That was quite nice. Was it difficult to research all these things in the 1970s? It was quite hard because there was no, nothing, we didn't have uh, the internet. Yeah. So it was all done with uh, you know, legwork. You, I had to go to records offices and... Uh, write to people and go to places and yeah it was it was quite a lot of a lot of hard work and that as well all of the past lives to be honest researching so yes it was quite a lot of and you've been to Ireland twice quite a number of times yeah. <laughs> I've actually lost count uh, yes quite a number of times sometimes just in day trips mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's amazing you can go on a, a commuter type day trip to, to Ireland uh, so yes, quite a few times, and uh, back to Malahide, mm. normally quite a few times. The first visit was probably the most The um, The first one was because I, I went on my own and it was just uh, a weekend away. It was, it was probably the most helpful in a way because everything that I'd remembered unfolded in front of me. As I said, I walked around in the streets. I knew which way to turn. I knew which way to go. At one point, uh, halfway up um, Church Street, I went to turn left into a shortcut and realised that there was a house in there and there wasn't a shortcut. It was quite a lot later I found out that there had been a shortcut there and I was told what the, the trip was about. It was to uh, Mary's sister, who was, which is probably why I kept thinking about that particular road and passing the, um, the church in that road. It was the, the trip to visit the sister. Mm -hmm. So things unfolded. It was quite interesting. When I eventually found the family as well, um, uh, they would st one one of them would start talking about something that happened, and I'd say, "Oh yeah," and I'd finish the story, mm -hmm. or the other way round, um, I'd start talking about something, and then they'd finish the story. So mm -hmm. it was quite, <laughs> um, which was you know, it's nice confirmation. You went to Ireland and you tried to trace the family. What happened to the children? They were had they all been put into orphanages. Mm -hmm. I, the father wasn't able to look after them. He wasn't capable. Um, he had a drink problem apart from other things. Uh, so they'd taken all the children, the girls and boys were separated. Uh, the oldest boy was left with his father because he was old enough to, to work more or less in those days. I mean, we, we can still, would consider him still to be a child, but he was old enough to work. Um, and they didn't see each other. For The, the girls didn't see the boys mm. for uh, they just they didn't see them again until I came onto the scene. Uh, the boys then got um, separated through different things happening in their life, and they didn't meet up until a few years before they started to research. So the the family was fragmented. And in your previous life, you died quite young. Yes, uh, yes, um, um, thirty seven, I think. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. So so fairly young, and um, in. Uh, just after childbirth, the uh, eighth child, which was um, Elizabeth, which is funny because that's the same name I gave my doll mm -hmm. when I was a child. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, but yeah, it, it was, um, and I remembered the hospital room. Yeah. I remember dying. I remembered um, it was, uh, it had electricity, which I wasn't used to because we didn't have electricity at home. So it had lit corridors. And uh, it was quite strange. I managed to go back to the, the hospital room, and the first thing I, I thought, oh, it's got two windows. I mean, remembered one, and I walked back to where the bed was, and there was a pier between the windows that stuck out. So where I was in the bed in the room, I could only see the one window, and I could still see. You know, it was still um, it was a one story up, and uh, so I actually managed to locate the room. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which was, um, Slightly strange, very strange going back in there again and remembering. And the emotions of this. Oh, the whole thing mm -hmm. is something people don't tell you. The roller coaster ride, uh, the emotional uh, upheaval uh, is quite phenomenal. 
um, a lot of people research children who remember past lives, but the children themselves don't often get a say about how it feels. Mm -hmm. And it, it is um, really quite double-edged in a way. It's, it's fantastic if you're able to resolve the life. But in some part of you, some part of you um, is still in the past, and then all of a sudden you meet everybody and everything catches up and because you remember the children, you remember the family as it was the moment you died. And then you, you get, you, you know, okay, they've grown up and you, you meet them. But then part of, some part of the unconscious hasn't quite caught up mm. until you meet the people again. And it's, it's really quite, quite disturbing. It takes quite a while to uh, regain equilibrium after that kind of experience. It's worth doing, mm. definitely worth doing but uh, quite um, unbalancing, I think. That's what makes these stories convincing. There are emotions there, there is life there. Yes, the whole thing is, is about emotion. If it was just straightforward facts, uh, most of the children probably wouldn't even bother, I think. But it's, it's the, the fact that you have um, um, an emotional tie to the past that is the motivation to um, do anything more about it anyway, mm -hmm. finding out what happened. Do you think these memories have influenced your life now? I think at times they have swamped my life now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the, um, each time I've managed to resolve a past life, something else has happened and I've started to remember uh, another one that was buried a little deeper or a little deeper. And it's only recently that I've stopped researching uh, only in the last few years, because I've managed to find and resolve uh, so many of the, the past lives. Tell us about your search for the children and eventually meeting them. Um, I did, did it also, I wrote, just wrote, uh, because they had gone to different orphanages, I wrote to all of the orphanages in Dublin for a start, because I, I hadn't realised some of the, the boys had actually been sent to Dublin to start off with and then were sent to Cork because they'd run away from home. And they thought if they were caught, they, they couldn't run away from home. Um, but uh, a lot of the orphanages, because of the change in policy, a lot of the orphanages had closed down and children would be more frequently put into care instead in um, fostering and then uh, adoption. But there was a really nice priest, actually, who helped me. And he said this, this was a problem. that, um, And his, his orphanage was just closing. But he managed to find the baptism records for some of the children in the Malahide uh, Catholic Church. And um, that gave me definite names and definite dates of birth. My names were slightly uh, uncertain until then. Then I, um, I don't know quite how I was going to do it. So I just put an advert into a newspaper and somebody replied and gave me uh, the contact details for one of the brothers. Mm -hmm. Then I phoned. I really don't like telephones. Um, it's not, not my ideal way of, of communicating with people. But I, I phoned and um, it wasn't easy. I mean, what do you say? Uh, I've, I've rehearsed and rehearsed for years what I might say and it was still you get caught out because it's a, it's a phone. I much prefer a letter. You can kind of throw, uh, take your time over a letter and uh, make sure it says exactly what you want to say. But no, it was, a, it was a phone call. But I did manage to, during the conversation, I was given the uh, contact details for the older brother as well, because it was the second brother I'd, I'd phoned. And um, I was so bothered that it took me a few weeks to, to do anything at all. And meanwhile, I had watched a documentary about past life memory and thought, well, maybe somebody involved with the team could, if, I, if I had a researcher kind of between me and the older brother uh, to cushion things a little bit. So I managed to contact a researcher, and they were willing, a, a, a lady working for the BBC, to uh, interview uh, Sonny, uh, the oldest uh, member of the f family, and myself separately before mm -hmm. we met. So that, uh, I mean, it, it turned out that the programme they were doing, it wasn't, it dropped from the programme. Well, actually, that was a blessing because it's a lot of pressure at that stage in the uh, relationship when we hadn't even met. So when we did meet up, we had these nine pages of information that I had given about his childhood and you know, my memories and his memories. And there were 
nine pages of things that matched. Mm -hmm. Loads and loads and loads of details that match, right down to the little things like, you know, were there any pets? And I said, well, there was. And I described this dog and I said, it wasn't mine, it belonged to the children. Uh, and sure enough, same description of the dog. Um, any other animals around? Well, just, just the donkey. Um, so, uh, and the stuffing of the, the mattress, lots and lots and lots of just separate different events that matched up. Then it was a matter of driving up there and a meeting, mm -hmm. which went remarkably well. He was uh, very accepting. How old was he then? At the time, I think he was about 72. And you were? Uh, I was about 40, I suppose, no less than that, but not much, 30-something. Um, uh, I didn't mention reincarnation. I didn't think it was a good idea from the uh, start. Um, I did mention that I had some memories. I used the expression that I remember things in dreams because I thought it was easier. In fact, most of the memories weren't in dreams. They were just ordinary memories. It was only the death that I remembered um, in dreams. But it was just to ease in, to just to make it easier. And um, slowly, slowly, I mean, we went to visit a few times. I went up um, a couple of times um, in day trips as well. Uh, and over time, eventually, he mentioned reincarnation. And uh, I said, well, actually, that is how I see it. How do you feel about it? And oh, yeah, he seemed quite happy. Mm -hmm. Then um, I, he actually encouraged me to turn my notes into a book. Mm -hmm. So I was quite happy that, because you know, I wasn't sure about any kind of publicity. I really didn't know whether this was a good thing. I didn't care particularly for myself, but for the family, whether this was going to be a good thing. And slowly, slowly we managed to trace his brothers and sisters while I was working on the, the, the book. And then um, eventually I got accepted by a publisher I am dyslexic as well as my father, so it took me a lot of writing to try to get the thing in uh, shape so that it was, uh, it was okay. I, I spent a few years learning to spell, <laughs> but uh, I got there, determination. Uh, and uh, it was the first meeting of all of the survivors was due to the, the book and the publishers arranged it and we managed to find the, the last few people and get everyone together, which was quite something. So then I met up with everybody around the table and I was still thinking, oh, I don't, don't know whether, whether they quite realised that I look at it as reincarnation because I still hadn't mentioned it to all of them. And then Sonny brought it up and he said, well, what do you think? And it turned out that everybody accepted that I did have these memories. One or two of them thought that perhaps I had some kind of um, psychic connection with their mother. Uh, others were quite happy to see it as reincarnation. And, and I wasn't going to argue. It's back to my um, tolerance of different views. It's not up to me oh, to yeah. tell somebody how to look at something. Just say, well, this is it, this is what's happened, this is what I think it is. Um, make your own mind up. That's, uh, that's really the only fair way of doing it, and particularly with the, the, the children, because uh, I, I cared about them. When you sat with them together, what did you feel? Were you aware that they were your children? It, the first thing that strikes you whenever, I've done this a couple of times now, when you meet people from a, a previous life, is that you're very aware that you're not quite who you were. They are, you know who they are, you know how you feel, but you're presenting in a different body, you're aware that they can't see you as the person you were, and in any case, in some ways you're slightly different because you've got the add-on from genetics with each life, so that the, the person inside is the same, the person inside feels the same, but you don't look the same, you don't necessarily have the same mannerisms, except that I did have quite a lot of the same mannerisms. Uh, yeah. But uh, I would say I'm probably very nervous. I didn't want to upset them. Uh, I was delighted, absolutely brilliant to find them, but at the same time very nervous and very protective, um, particularly as uh, we were meeting and a documentary was being made at the same time, and I was thinking, have I done the right thing? <laughs> is, you know, is this the, the way to, to uh, get the meeting, our, our first meeting, with, with, uh, the, it's making it a very public event? But um, I found out later, actually, they were, they were all very pleased, very pleased with it. Would you have recognised them? Um, Bearing in mind physically, so not so much. Um, personality, absolutely. They were very much the same personalities that I'd remembered. 
The one who was always mischievous was still mischievous. The one who was very quiet and nervous was still very quiet and withdrawn and watch other people and let them talk. Um, Sonny, who was always absolutely direct and straightforward, still was. So, very, yes, yes, the personality is very much so. How did they accept you? What was their impression? Yeah, they all did have a slightly different take. Um, uh, Christie actually went to his priest and his priest said, well, um, we don't generally believe in reincarnation, but uh, obviously there's, there's, there's something going on there. And he was, Christy was quite happy to accept that that's what it was. It, I, I had been his mother. Um, the, the two girls were much, uh, they, they, they couldn't quite accept it as, as that, but they thought that perhaps I was, um, I just as it had access you know, to their mother's memories. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, uh, they were actually very good. I felt um, for connected. But at the same time, there's just this one step um, away because of the time lag and because of uh, the, the, the change in life. So um, I did manage to maintain a relationship with them for the rest of their lives, which was, I was very lucky. I mean, I think that's extremely fortunate to be able to have done that. Uh, and then you, you lose them again, but at least this time around, I I'd, I'd knew what had happened to them. I'd had that chance, and um, it, wasn't, it wasn't like leaving children behind. Mm-hmm. It was a much more natural process. But, um, some, of the, some of the other lives have, have been slightly easier. When I researched in Japan, it was, it was harder to find the information for the exact person. Yeah. How did you know that you had to look to Japan, I always uh, it was another it's another memory I'd always known mm-hmm. um, from childhood. Um, it's one that I didn't use hypnosis for at all, uh, but I'd always known roughly where it was, and I'd, I used to draw pictures in the, uh, the same atlas. I knew it was at the uh, north of the South Island, um, on the, the edge, and there was a, a peninsula. Uh, I couldn't find detailed maps of Japan, and I'm not quite sure. What triggered the research? I think I eventually managed to find a, a map, a, ma- a more detailed map, and exactly where I was looking, there was a peninsula. I thought, oh, uh, we're getting somewhere. This is good. Um, and as I started to, I'm trying to remember how that research started off. I, I think I just get obsessed and just keep going. I did manage to get a trip to Japan and had a look around um, in the area. It wasn't terribly successful. It was mm. with a Japanese film company, but um, uh, it, the, I didn't really have the time to sort of stop, think and relax and uh, think about where I was. So when I got back, I learned to write in Japanese. <laughs> I taught myself to write in Japanese so that I could write letters of inquiry. Um, I couldn't write in Japanese now, but at the time I just concentrated and, and produced some letters of inquiry and um, found out what I could about the area, found out when different bridges were built, because I remember that was a, a, it was a boat trip. Uh, I remember um, falling off the boat on a boat trip. Then eventually I managed to get contact with a lady, a Japanese lady, who followed up and she actually visited the area, and it turned out that the people who, whose family it was had been interviewed, <laughs> not, not in my presence, um, when the, 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 the Japanese company were there. Uh, but the, 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 the point for them that um, made, it, made them aware that I was actually knew what I was talking about was I had um, drawn pictures of the, where the house was, the exact location that it was hanging on the edge of the cliff. And this Japanese lady who was helping me said, uh, no, surely you don't, you don't mean right on the edge of the cliff. I said, yeah, it was right on the edge of the cliff. And there was a little uh, veranda and you could look out and down the cliff and the sea, it was, it was fantastic. Um, when she gave all the details, she said, well, okay, I'll ask them. I don't think it can have been there. I said, well, it was. And they just said, well, how did you know about our house? It had been demolished years earlier. But the family, it had been in the family for a long time and they'd used the house as, uh, in the summer. But, uh, so it was, I was able to also get um, lots of details to match. Like I remember when I first started to learn to read and write when I was in Japan. Um, 
and it was it coincided with um, the Magi Restoration, where girls were given an education for the first time. In that life. In that life, yes. So when was there that? were lots of it was. Um, so we're talking about the towards the end of the um, 1800s, so 1860s um, into the early 1870s. So it was a short, very short life. And do you have a sense of the circumstances, what happened? Yes, it was, it's obviously it was before Mary, mm -hmm. it was a life just before Mary. Uh, yeah, most of it again is, um, when I was a child, I used to remember standing on the veranda. Uh, when I was a child in this life, I used to remember standing on the veranda in, in Japan and just watching the sea. It was absolutely mesmerizing. It was, uh, when I went there, the sea churns around a lot uh, there. It's not, not a gentle sea. Um, and just, just looking at it and this not quite wanting to go to the very edge of the veranda, not quite trusting the rail. Mm. Uh, uh, and I remember doing odd jobs around the house. I remember uh, being made to, to do some of the cleaning, uh, which is un not unusual apparently. Uh, you, know, you expect the children to do some work. But um, there are odd trips and I do remember the, the trip on the boat uh, which was the, the end of that life and terrible feelings of, of guilt about the whole thing which Why? was um, because uh, I, I suppose uh, it was to do with the mindset that uh, I was being taken to meet someone to, for a marriage and uh, didn't manage to fulfill my father's wishes that I should be married. So it was uh, guilt that I didn't manage to I'd survive. <laughs> to, the boat sank, uh, you wrote in your book. Um, I, there was actually a collision and I fell off. Um, I think several people fell in the water and I had not learned to swim. Um, so you know, it's, uh, it was just uh, one of those silly, silly things. But I was unable to find complete records of the person. So it was only um, you know, odd things that I was able to confirm to, on that one. On the last life I've managed to research, which is the one I'm um, have been working on most recently, and haven't uh, managed to publish yet. Um, Where was, was that? Gateshead. Um, I was I, as a child. I had always remembered, or always had this fear of being um, hit by a truck. Um, certainly, around the age of five or six, I was very bothered. I was a very careful road crosser, and there are other bits that didn't all together. Uh, gel. I hadn't added them all up. There's a house that I'd mentioned to people for years. I was looking for this house. I said, uh, I'm sure I'll, I'll get to this house. And as it turned out, it was the house in Gateshead that I'd remembered. Um, so the, 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 what motivated me in the end is, as I resolved each life, as I said, another one would become more prominent and I'd have to, have to resolve that as well. But this particular one, it, I'd remembered the injury I, all my life I've remembered the injury. Um, I, my legs were crushed, part of it. Uh, my legs were crushed and then I didn't remember what happened next. When was that? In 1945. Mm -hmm. So it was um, as a six-year-old mm -hmm. uh, in, in between the um, uh, life as Mary and the life as now. Uh, hypnosis did actually help on that. It helped me remember some of the bits I hadn't remembered. So I got things like um, the road name um, under hypnosis, I gave a couple of letters that were in the road name, the double L and an E, and it turned out that it was Elliot. Uh, so I got the, the I thought that was, was not bad. I remember where the school was. So eventually on maps, I, mean, I think I took a long time researching that one. I was really bothered. I didn't want to research it while the mother was still alive. Um, I just thought that was a horrible thing to go back to a mother and say, I rem remember being the child, you, I, just, I just thought it wasn't. Uh, so I, I, I did, I put it off for years, but eventually managed to do it and eventually found a family member and I'm still in contact. It's, mm -hmm. um, it's worked out fine. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot easier than it had been in the past because I think I'm much more relaxed about it and um, I was able to talk more easily about it. And, and what was their reaction? Um, great. I mean, I provided the evidence I had. Um, we talked about a few details. Um, are those, are those one, one little, there was one or two little sort of odd bits where I realised some of my mannerisms from there. Um, well, one of, when I started getting a few white hairs, one of the things I, I used to say to people, um, oh yes, I'm going blonde. 
Um, when I was talking to this surviving relative, um, we were talking about hair colour, and I said, oh, yes, he's, he had dark hair. And he said, um, well, yes, I, so did I, but I'm going blonde now. And I, oh, OK. <laughs> so, yeah, odd, odd bits and bits and pieces that seem to transfer over. But, uh, yeah, uh, I think over time I, I, it has got easier. Uh, I've been more relaxed about it. I, I, I'm mostly, I think you're supposed to forget your past lives. I think you're supposed to be able to forget mm. and live this life. And it's taken me this long <laughs> to be able to resolve enough of my past lives that I can now feel I can live in the present. It's about time. <laughs> How many of them do you remember? Uh, you see, that's quite difficult because often you remember fragments and you can't always piece them together. Um, one of the lives I remembered as a child was also as a, a child who was, a French child, um, who was, um, from what I can understand, sold into service, um, put, put to work as a child, as a servant in, in a house. And I can remember fragments of that, but um, would be unsure about the exact location. Uh, we did cover bits of that with the hypnosis and I thought oh oh this is the same one um, but I don't really rely on hypnosis a lot for, for the details so I would say that was probably not I would, wouldn't be able to resolve that apart from it it was quite a long time ago and then you, there are just loads and loads of bits another one that I um, always remember from childhood was as a um, hunter a neolithic hunter well <laughs> that was an awful long time ago, but I loved that when I was a child, remembering that. It was um, the freedom, uh, a male hunter. Mm -hmm. that was a, um, so yeah, there, there were some very good memories of that. So uh, there are a lot, uh, probably at least a dozen, say, um, different, different memories from different times. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's a development of your personality throughout these lives? There is a consistency to the core personality. Um, I've been very interested in this because uh, uh, I've been doing quite a lot of family research and looking at genetic links and how much genetics affect your personality. So you can find um, relatives with some similar characteristics. Well, obviously, the person who goes from life to life has nothing to do with genetics. It's a different part of you. But I think the person is the person on the inside looking out uh, who doesn't seem to change very much or changes but with slow evolution in the same way that um, you change from childhood to adulthood. There is still, you're still partly the child you were mm -hmm. even into adulthood. There's quite a, a, a bit of the, the child that you were there. Um, and a life to life, there is that core personality that goes from one to the next. So there's probably a very gradual change in that. But the, the amount of overlay that uh, the inherited body brings, and um, I mean, even if you, like from the simplest terms, if you have um, a particular hormone imbalance, it will change the way you behave. Hormones are physical, they're part of the body. So, um, you'd expect that to be um, extra to the, 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 the core personality. It's an interesting idea to try and find out exactly how much of the real you is the you that gets transferred. Um, I think it's probably the, the amount that, that is brought by DNA is probably more considerable than I would like to think, but I think there's probably quite a lot that is, the, the, the jacket that you put on with each life, the physical body, has um, physical effects on the way that you present as a person. The experiences you have in one life will shape your personality. It's, it's an add-on. The experiences that you've ha always had will shape the way that you uh, interact with others, same. Um, the amount of tolerance you might have. Uh, you might bring anger from one life to another and find that you don't understand, you might have an emotion that you just don't understand, that you might have just brought with you. So yes, life to life, each life is going to affect you every bit as much as things that have happened in your current life. Um, 
as you were saying quite rightly, most people wouldn't be aware. And I think, you're, back to what I had said earlier, I don't think that you are supposed to remember past lives. I don't think you're necessarily supposed to be aware of what has shaped you and made you the person you are now. Why not? It's, it's an awful, I think it's an awful lot to carry with you. Uh, for, you know, to, to, uh, it, to, it depends on what's happened. I mean, if there, there are things that sometimes you would be better shutting out and moving away from, they'll still be, the, your reactions will still be there in the unconscious. But um, I think there are, for example, there are, I think there are some forms of therapy where digging up what has happened in this life before you are prepared to look at it, can be counterproductive. Um, I think that given time, you will cope with the things that you need to cope with at the pace, as long as you do cope with them when they come up, uh, at the pace that you can manage. Um, but if you're born with uh, a great deal of, I mean, some of the things that happen to people, you, you just wouldn't want to have to cope with, you wouldn't want to have to remember. I don't think it would be easy to um, to live a a, a life uh, uncluttered. Yeah. Some people say, if you don't remember, so what is the point? Well, you don't need to remember, but it's it's part of your evolution anyway. Mm -hmm. It will still affect you whether you remember it or not. It will still um, temper your character. And I think they, there is an evolution. That get, we, there is the obvious evolution. There is a physical evolution that creatures evolve, they change. But I think there is also an evolution of the soul that you move on and you change and you develop so that um, they would go hand in hand and it will affect societies um, more than even just the individual level. I think that this is, this is a good thing because societies move forward with what I see as the change of the soul, the evolution of the soul. So you never doubted your memories? No. No, um, no, not really. <laughs> no, I think um, there's a certain um, uh, determination there that uh, I, I wasn't going to, even as a child, except when other people started to tell me, that's not real. Mm -hmm. No, actually it is. So no, not really. How difficult is it to prove that your memories are accurate? When it comes to proving um, that you had previous lives, you're not going to get the kind of evidence that some people feel is necessary. You're not going to get your national insurance number, you're not going to get your telephone number, you're not going to remember things like that. All you've got is um, your memories of events, the way you feel, um, places, uh, odd details, things that have happened, and it's the amassing those memories. So it's not one person's memory of a past life, it's not even dozens, there are hundreds and hundreds and um, probably thousands of people, who, well, there are thousands of people who have remembered past lives, who've been researched. So really, it's best to research children who remember, because they are nearer the source. They are, they're most likely to remember enough detail to actually follow up and find a, a past life family, which is what you need to do. You need to then compare the memories with the memories of the past life family as well, and make sure... Um, it's best if they're not publicly known facts, so that they're things that only that family knew. And in the end, you're not going to convince people who do not wish to be convinced. That's fine. Everybody is allowed. And it is quite valid for people to have a different point of view, as long as um, when they're analysing something, they actually use the, the facts in front of them. Mm -hmm. um, if you take a set of facts, and you have uh, one person has one opinion on those facts and another person has a different opinion, that's fine, as long as the facts are right to start off with. So um, we're probably, uh, the, the researchers are probably doing as much as they possibly can do to evidence past lives, but you're never going to convince everybody because people have different opinions. Um, and people sometimes find the whole thing so uncomfortable that even if you could tag a person somehow, and then the tag appears in the next life. Um, some sort of, I, I don't know, um, assuming that you're um, some kind of electromagnetic energy, perhaps, that passes from one life to another, if there's some way of marking it, even if that kind of evidence was available, you still wouldn't convince everybody. 
-hmm. So all you can do in anything like this is say, well, this is what happens, this is what happened to me, Exp express it all, lay it all on the table, um, make your own mind up. This is presumably why you're writing your books. Yeah, it, it, that, the, reason, the, the reasons I wrote the books weren't actually um, to produce evidence uh, as much as to externalize, to uh, have an, make it cathartic, to get it out of my system, um, but also to share so that, to initially, certainly it was to share so that other people going through the same experience can be uh, validated uh, in their own experience. Uh, can see some of the methods you might use if you're self-researching and perhaps have the confidence. Uh, it, 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 I've got quite a few people who have actually managed to trace their families and aren't sure if they want to approach or how to approach. So I get people um, coming for advice, which is fine. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's what it's about. It's about helping people with their, their own process, with their own uh, research. With, with just a bit of advice here and there, anyway. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you think these lives are heading towards a certain point? It may be a long way off, though. Yeah. Um, we may have, at the beginning of the universe, we may have been um, part of us. Will have, well, we will have been the Big Bang. Everything started. Um, what became consciousness would have been there. And possibly the whole experience of consciousness ends when everything ends. So yes, we we may be heading there, but it may be a lot further away than we might imagine. Do you think there's a goal in that development? Um, the goal might simply be, uh, or, or be as simple as um, experiencing and understanding, um, which you know, that could be enough. Um, I don't have all the answers. <laughs> we're uh, we're still on the journey, mm -hmm. and we've got a lo long way to go, but. Uh, there are lots of it, it does get exciting sort of thinking all the different possibilities you know where it's going and what what conclusion you know where we will be eventually but you know, it would be interesting to think that we might um connect mm -hmm. better with each other um you know at a at perhaps at an unconscious level when well, maybe we already do and don't don't know but, do you think that society is more accepting of the idea of reincarnation now? I've seen a huge change yeah. from when I first started, and um, it was considered odd, very, very odd. Now I think um, you know, lots of people see it as well, that's what happens. It's quite normal. Uh, there have been some lovely uh, cases that have been well documented where parents have heard their children talking about past lives. So then they think, oh, okay, well, we'll re-research this. We'll ask the right questions and see what happens. We'll um, put possibilities and see which one they go for. And, uh, and they're actually doing it quite well without having to think twice about it. They just instinctively know now how to help research travel. Which that's, that's really a lot further on from uh, where I started. Mm -hmm. It's a lot better. So there is progress. Yes, I think there's progress getting there. Thank you very much Jenny for your time and for your very interesting experiences. Thank you. Mm -hmm.